morning, everybody. Um, the subject is my title. I chose What's Wrong with Mercury. Um, I work in Darmstadt um, at the European Space Operations Center. It's just uh, two hours from here. Um, we plan to send a spacecraft to Mercury in 2015. Um, I'm responsible for the mission analysis, so we designed the trajectory how to go to Mercury. And um, at the beginning, uh, Mercury was uh, yeah, it's just a um, small planet in the solar system. It's not as exciting as Mars. Mars, there may be life, and there's a lot of stories to create and um, bunnies on Mars. But Mercury is pretty dead. So um, at the first sight, probably your associations with Mercury, they're not very spectacular. I try to change this image with this talk and tell you about the fascinating facets of, of Mercury. Um, just to get an impression, who of you have seen Mercury in the sky already? Uh, a few hands go up, but not too many. So only the real space or the astronomers they they um, they find it uh, because um, what you what you see usually is uh, Venus, um, Jupiter, Mars, and Mercury, uh, um, and um, Saturn. But the Greeks they already um, if you if you know where to look and when to look, you find Mercury in the sky. Um, it's basically um, right after sunset, because Mercury never moves far away from the sun. It's um, close, the innermost planet around uh, the sun. So it's either right trailing a bit um, the sun, so it's after sunset you can see it, or in the early morning hours before the sun is rising, you can see it. So there is a couple of occasions in the year where you have got uh, good opportunities to see it, but you have to be dedicated, you have to know where to look at the right time. Um, but um, yeah, since centuries Mercury is known and um, it's yeah, somehow a forgotten planet. Um, the space flights they concentrate on, on Mars, on Jupiter, on, um, yeah, on Venus, but Mercury was not really visited a lot in the past. Um, <coughs> Mercury still um, gives us a lot of questions. At first glance it looks like a moon. There's some nice features here. So doesn't look nice, and eyes and neutrons. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's nice, but um, it looks like basically like, like the moon, a dead rock. Nothing active, no volcanoes, no tectonics, so a bit dead. Um, to give you some basic facts about Mercury, um, the diameter is nearly 5,000 kilometers, so it's 38% um, of the Earth. This is also, I mean, you, if you scale it with the Earth, this is the, the factor. Also, the gravity on the surface would be 38%. Um, yeah, so it's much smaller, but it's still it's 40% larger than our moon. But otherwise, it looks a bit like the moon. And the distance to the sun um, varies between 46 and 70 million kilometers. So this is also something uh, interesting about Mercury. It's not in a circular um, orbit; it's quite eccentric. And um, with the perihelion um, motion of, of Mercury, you could see a relativistic, a relativistic effects. So there are some um, features which make Mercury interesting. But still, um, you had to convince the, the NASA or ESA to, to spend money to explore it. It didn't look too attractive. Well, I um, want to start a bit with history. I call it early deceptions. Uh, Mercury already, um, at the beginning when they started to observe, it was Hieronymus Schroeder in Bremen. He was, at that time, he had the best telescope, a 50 centimeter telescope in um, um, Lilienthal, it's close to Bremen. Um, at that time, it was the best in the world, and he was looking at uh, Mercury, and um, they discovered 20 kilometer high mountains, they saw valleys and all kinds of features, and they looked at the rotation rate, and they found that it's um, 24 hours, 0 minutes, and 50 seconds, so they very precisely measured the rotation rate, and um, saw they could see all kinds of, of things. It's all not true, but that's what the scientists at that time their means they could find and the funny thing is the other scientists they looked at the same and they confirmed the results <laughs> then um, 100 years later uh, Giovanni Schiaparelli um, was looking at, at uh, Mercury maybe you remember the name he was the guy who was um, finding the canals on, on Mars so at night he was putting his telescope to Mars and was drawing all the canals on, on Mars and during daytime he knew where Mercury was, he could point his telescope to Mercury and he was drawing um, this map of, of Mercury. So he, he also finds some canals which are optical or artifacts from the optics. They don't exist, but that's what you could see with his telescope. 
you know, with, yeah, the best features was kind of these maps. They try to, to draw the maps. They're completely made up. I mean, they, they look, he, he was looking for 10 years to Mercury and try to find um, features. And President Lowell, he draw this in Antonyadi. They gave them names and they, they had um, valleys and, and they made a, a nice map of Mercury with all the um, yeah, valleys and, and mountain rigs. And, but it's, it does not exist. But these were really good scientists and they, they tried whatever they could do. But um, at that time it was just impossible. But still, you try, you, if you look for 10 years for something, you have to publish something. <laughs> like nowadays, our scientists, um, you cannot say, I don't see anything. You try to, whatever you see, you try to, to be as good as possible. But it, it was not possible at that time. The rotation rate, all of them, they came now to 88 days. 88 days is the period which mm -hmm. takes Mercury to go around the Sun. So what they assume, that uh, Mercury is in a fixed rotation, so it always shows the same face um, to the Sun. And this uh, was um, basically when I was a little kid. Um, that was the book I got from my parents. And there's a chapter about Mercury. And this is the, the drawing from Scavarelli from 100 years ago. They still had this in the book and it says the, the planet Mercury always faces the Sun the same side. So it's still at the rotation rate of 88 days. Um, published in the books, and when I was that was the truth when I was a kid. But um, in 1965, the Arecibo radio telescope changed the picture. They could um, observe um, basically Mercury, and you see the rotation. Um, the, the one side of Mercury is approaching you, and the other side is um, going away. So with the Doppler, which you can very precisely measure with the radar from here. Um, there you could see, they could really precisely measure the rotation rate and it was 58.65 days. So Mercury makes three revolutions, uh, two revolutions around the Sun and has three rotations of, of the own body. So it's a three to two resonance with the orbital motion. This was the Arecibo radar here in uh, Puerto Rico. Maybe you remember it from a James Bond movie. It was the, the guy that was fighting in there. <laughs> So, but this went into service in 1965, and so immediately they, they found the truth. Um, this 3 to 2 resonance has a quite nice effect on the um, on the um, how the sun looks like when we are on Mercury. I have here a video. We are sitting on Mercury on the equator, and um, we see we will see the sun rising. Um, we see here the temperature. This, the distance of Mercury to the Sun, and this is the date, um, basically June 2020. We hope that we will arrive with our spacecraft at Mercury. So we made a simulation. If you would sit on Mercury, how it looks like. The temperature here is minus 172 degrees, so we are at night. Since we have this very slow rotation, Mercury has no atmosphere at night. It gets really cold there, so it's all radiating all the heat. At daytime, we will see it reaches more than 400 degrees, but at night it's really cold. And now when I start it, we will see how the sun is rising. Oops. Now you see Mercury, the sun distance is um, getting smaller, the, it's going to the pericenter. The sun is rising, the temperatures are now already at 300 degrees. And at um, three now at three of October, you see suddenly the sun stops. You know it stops, it goes backward six days, and on nine of August it moves backward. I just try to repeat it. And so, if you have seen it, the, the peak temperature reached 400 degrees. I just repeat it once more, so we have more time. So the temperature, the sun is rising quickly, goes to 400 degrees at the at the maximum. The distance, the sun distance is shrinking now. We are reaching the closest point at 40 million, 46 million kilometer in the um, 6th of July. Now we are at the closest point, it's getting hottest, more than 400 degrees. So the sun stops, and um, there was a, a TV show from um, Haran Lesh, he showed it and he said, um, If you are at the right time, the sun, you can see a sunrise, sunset, and sunrise again. Or, so it can be quite romantic on Mercury. <laughs> you see sunrise or sunset, you can see it twice. Um, 
the reason is basically maybe I take out my mercury. Um, so um, since we are in a highly eccentric orbit, at one point when, you, when we get close to the sun, mercury is quite fast. And then the rotation around the sun is faster than the own rotation. And that's why it looks like the sun is moving backward. So usually the sun, uh, the mercury is traveling around and you rotate faster, that's why it's like on Earth, the sun is slowly moving upward, but one day takes 176 days until the sun uh, is rising and setting. So it's very slow, the sun, as you have seen, it's, um, it's taking a long time, and at one point in time when Mercury is really at the perihelion, when it's uh, rotating fast around the sun, the, ro the, the rotation around the sun is faster than the own ro rotation, and that's why it looks like the sun stops, moves backward and moves forward again. A very unique feature at Mercury. Um, so what is wrong with Mercury, I was asking. And one of the problems with Mercury, um, we want to know the shape. What's, it's not every planet, it's not perfectly <coughs> round, it's like the Earth, we have an oblateness, the poles are flatter, and it's the same we know for Mercury, it has all kind of um, irregularities. And um, since we plan to, spend, to send a spacecraft around Mercury, we need to know the gravity field. We want to predict after a few months uh, where our spacecraft will, will be, because if you have a perfect sphere, your orbit doesn't change. But if you have your plateness, maybe you, you remember from orbital mechanics, you have a precession of the orbital plane, your um, line of absides is moving. So if it's not a perfect sphere, um, your, your orbit will change. And um, we were we have to know if we will crash on, on Mercury or if we, wherever the orbit is, is going to. So what we, what we are studying is the, the altitude of our spacecraft. We start at 400 km and then we try to predict how it's evolving. And it's depending on the, the J2 term and the J3 term. These are the gravity potential describing basically the shape, whether it's flat or whether the pier shape is um, the asymmetry between the north side, northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. If you have more mass in the northern hemisphere, you go this way. If you have more mass in the southern hemisphere, you might go this way. And when I started um, doing these calculations, we had no clue about the sign of the, of the J3, uh, where Mercury is more mass north or south. So um, we had this situation. In one case, the J3 is negative, we crash within a few days, oh, yeah, this is 300 days, you would crash on Mercury. Um, another case, we get to a uh, lower altitude, 200 degrees, we really get hot. Mercury, we have seen it's 400 degrees, we get all the albedo, and our spacecraft is not meant to survive this um, high thermal um, albedo from the surface, so we want to exclude these cases, and, um, but also this case is not interesting because we want to take photos from Mercury surface. So if we quickly drift away from the, from the altitude, we cannot make nice science experiments here. So we need to know the J2 and J3 terms in order to design our initial altitude. I mean this one we can choose basically and we can make some provision that we stay in the area. But the prerequisite is we need to know the gravity field. So we saw, okay. NASA, they sent the spacecraft to Mercury in 2011, in March 2011, they, they are in orbit, and these gravity field put, um, coefficients, once you're in orbit, you're you, you quickly can measure them very precisely. So we're, we're, we're hoping that uh, we get from, the, from NASA, from their data, we will get the results. They had um, in 2011, September 2011, in the science magazine, with a renowned um, science, uh, where results about science are published, is all about messenger orbits Mercury. They have seven papers presenting the results, but there was nothing on the gravity field. We, we try to, I mean, we have some um, connection with them, so we, we asked them that, yeah, be patient, we have some trouble. They, they try to make orbit predictions and fit the data, and it just it didn't work out. They, they always had a lot of trouble. But they went to a conference last year in San Francisco in December last year. And so we took, with the camera, we took a photo from the, from the screen. And here you see the, the gravity potentials. But they, they really um, didn't dare to publish them. Because uh, these numbers, uh, I mean, you see the precision plus minus, very small numbers. 
here they have high precision numbers, but they could be completely wrong. So they really said, take this with care, and they, they, are, they don't, don't, didn't publish them. So there's a bug on their papers, and we are desperately waiting for official numbers. Still today, we haven't got any official numbers about the Mercury gravity field. The problem is, in the orbit which they are flying, um, they have a highly eccentric orbit, so they, they cannot sample um, the gravity field very nicely, so they, they get um, artifacts and um, residuals in the data fitting, so um, they, yeah, they are still fighting with the data and um, it's not yet, not yet solved, so we are still trying to, to get a better grip on the gravity field. Next story, which is a bit related, um, was the question was whether Mercury has a solid or a liquid core. Oh, I forgot one of my, one of my things to show. <laughs> Just the regular egg. Draw the egg somewhere, okay. <laughs> I don't need it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Should be an egg, yeah. Um, you know when you spin you spin an egg, um, you see the difference whether it's um, boiled or whether it's raw. And it's the same with mercury. Mercury is spinning and uh, we don't know whether it has a solid core or a liquid core. And um, the, we made um, um, an analytical um, simulations and calculations. And um, you see that um, I mean, when when it's spinning, you have you have a libration motion. So, um, like with the egg, when it's completely solid, it's it's the libration is smaller because the, the kernel, the core itself, is also to do the same libration motion. But if you have a, um, a, a molten core, a liquid core, um, the core um, doesn't join the, the whole motion. So only the outer uh, mantle is doing this libration motion. I mean. Because of the eccentric orbit, the sun is pulling. You have these tidal effects, it's like, uh, like the, moon, the, the moon is on, exacting, is doing this force on the Earth. You have the same on the moon, on, on the Mercury, that um, you have a small libration motion, which means when you're looking at Mercury, at some point the meridians or the craters which you can observe, at one point they are a um, few hundred meters more to the east, and when you see them next time, they are more to the west. So you have this vibration motion which you want to observe. And um, there was a paper, a conference in July 2004 in Paris, where um, again one who, who used this Arecibo radar, they were looking at Mercury, and now they want to see these tiny changes. I mean, you see this rotation um, on Mercury, what we have seen, the, the 58 days the rotation, but on top of this rotation you have a slight deviation. This is this vibration which is the tide from the Sun, uh, which is created. And we want to, to see this small deviation from the normal rot rotation. And they claimed, with their um, radar observations, they see this, this vibration motion. You see these dots where they fit a sine curve through. So they claim that they can see um, these tiny deviations, which are the, from, the, from the tides coming from the sun. And the amplitude was 60 arc seconds. This means um, the crater on the surface of Mercury um, at the maximum elongation is 600 meters to the east and the other side is 600 degrees on the west. So when you, when you orbit Mercury you could really see that the, that the craters are not exactly where they should be but they are moving all the time. Um, 600 meters or 60 arc seconds, this was a bit too much. Um, we had published a paper in 2004, the same year, where we made, uh, said um, we tried to estimate this vibration amplitude. And um, from this theoretical analysis, it was clear that it's either 20 arc seconds when we have a solid core, when it's all in one, one thing, so not everything is uh, vibrating, or uh, the, the vibration is smaller because everything is in one uh, homogeneous object. And the maximum is 40 arc seconds if it's a liquid core, so only the mantle is rotating, so you have a higher li uh, vibration amplitude. So um, I was there at the conference and I went to um, this person from, from NASA and I told him, look, this 60 arc seconds, this doesn't fit with theory, it can be either, it must be somewhere between 20 and 40. 
and in our paper we took some basic assumptions and we said um, maybe it could be 35 if, if, if this assumptions. Okay, we left three years later, publication in science, large longitude vibration of mercury reveals the moment before <coughs> on the top front page of science, science is the biggest magazine talking about scientific uh, results and he published um, the vibration 35.8 plus minus 2 arc seconds so they, the same data, the radar data, suddenly he was within the, not only between 20 and 40 but he had exactly the number which uh, we had predicted in our theoretical paper and um, so I, I wonder how, how this comes and, and my explanation or I think it's, it's like before in Mercury you look for many years, you, s you see something, you want to see something and you find what, what you see, this is the uh, a human feature that, and the same, maybe, I, I don't know, with the, with the radars now they know what they are looking for and I talked to the guy later and said yeah we had a bug in the software and I mean you, you have so much data which is contradictory and if you know a result which you want to achieve and as soon as you get it you're happy, you stop investigating you, you, uh, but before you, you, you try to tune your parameters, you have to estimate temperatures and it's such a complex data processing so I'm a bit skeptical that maybe um, when they found the result they, they just were happy and that okay now it fits and um, they published this <coughs> with um, our um, Baby Colombo project, um, satellite in orbit hopefully we'll get the real result and then resolve all this but yeah this is the exciting thing with Mercury that um, yeah people are, are fooled into something and for, for years it's the, the official um, uh, numbers uh, until you, you learn the, the real truth. Let's see how it works, so we still uh, wait for the results. I have one more um, problem with, with Mercury, one um, riddle which, which you cannot fully explain, is the density. Um, here you have um, the radius of the objects, and here you have the spatial density, so you have Earth, Venus, um, when they are smaller, also the density is smaller, Mars, the moons, so they all fit more or less on a line, except Mercury is far off this line, so the question, how can you explain this high density of Mercury, which is not um, yeah, in line with all the other planets? This is our model we have of um, Mercury, you have a 100 to 300 kilometer thick crust, then you have a 600 km thick mantle and you have a huge iron core. <coughs> um, Earth is similar but the iron core is much smaller than this. So here you see it's um, yeah, more than 70% or 70% of the volume would be the, pure, the, the core of Mercury. And um, I mean this is, the model is existing since a long time and there are three theories why Mercury looks like this. Um, the first theory is that it's selective accretion. So you know, you we know, have the accretion disk at the beginning of the solar system and, and the planets formed when the, the, everything condensed. And Mercury maybe uh, when, when, the, when, the, when it formed, um, the lighter elements, the volatile elements, um, they had different um, aerodynamic forces, fragmentation forces. So in the inner solar system, the, the light objects did not survive, they were um, yeah, removed and only heavy objects, heavy, heavy elements remained to form Mercury so maybe it was already created like this. The second theory is um, that it was already, uh, it was like all the other planets but after the aggression it was vaporized so all this um, electromagnetic bombardment, the solar wind just er uh, eroded the outer um, shell of, of uh, Mercury and blew it away and only this remained to this high density. The third theory is that there was a gigantic impact which um, hit Mercury and blew away all the, the light material all the, all the, only the heavy um, st stuff remained. So um, the idea is now um, NASA sent the messenger spacecraft to Mercury. All these three theories predict a different chemical composition. So the only thing is what we have to do, we go there and with spectrometers, we just um, look at the surface, make a chemical um, analysis and then we know which one of the three um, theories will be right. So they had a clear difference, whatever we find we can decide. But, 
um, what they found, um, there was too, far, too much um, potassium, there was too much um, sulfur. None of the three theories matches with um, what, they, what, what kind of chemical um, elements they found. So now we have another riddle. What was, how was the mercury created? Why um, do we have such a strange composition, chemical composition? And now the scientists, they come up with new ideas. They think maybe it, um, mercury was created in orbit outside of Venus and migrated from there to the place where it is. Um, now with all these exoplanets being discovered, all these migration <coughs> theories have new impetus. So um, new, new um, theories are now postulated. And it's very, I mean, it's, it's right now, 2011, these this discoveries were made. And uh, we try to understand how Mercury was, um, came into existence. And I think this is quite um, exciting for, the, for us, Mercury, who, who cares about Mercury, how it was created. But it, we want to understand how our solar system was created. And if we are not able, if our models cannot deal with, with Mercury, if there was big migration processes, um, we have trouble to understand how, the, how also the Earth was created, how the whole solar system was created. So all these um, migration processes um, have an influence on the, um, on the prob probability that solar systems form like we have. So it has a long, uh, quite some implications on our understanding of the universe. So I think Mercury is not so boring. <laughs> and that's why Isa wants to go there. Um, we have this project called Baby Colombo. We are right now um, we are building parts of it. Um, the launch is supposed to be 16th of August 2015, with an arrival at Mercury January 2022. Anja is doing the details for the orbit insertion. <laughs> and um, the challenges are, I mean, we have xenon propulsion, 500 kilogram ion propulsion with xenon. Um, there will be two spacecraft here inside this sun shield. You see um, the Japanese um, MMO, uh, Mercury Magnetospheric Orbiter, which is supposed to go in a highly eccentric orbit, 400 times 12,000 kilometer. Um, in here you see the ESA part, so this is the Japanese part, this is the ESA satellite, the Mercury Planetary Orbiter, um, which is supposed to go in orbit 400 times 1,500 kilometer. And uh, we hope to solve all the, the problems which I just brought up and to get more um, data to, to, to explain all the features. Um, this is just a very brief introduction. I could give a whole talk about Betty Colombo and the mission. Um, maybe in the afternoon if there's lots free. <laughs> just make it some advertisement here. Um, what we do in Darmstadt is the trajectory calculation. Um, it's a very complicated trajectory. We have seven flybys. We leave the Earth one year later, we come back to the Earth to change the declination basically, to get into the orbit to, to Venus. Then we have two Venus flybys. Um, we have to basically rotate our um, excess velocity with respect to Venus backward in order to, to slow down work with the inner solar system. So in order to save fuel, we use Venus to stop, to, to break our velocity, but one flyby doesn't provide us enough um, turn, so we have to do two Venus flybys, and then we have four Mercury flybys to further reduce the velocity. And at the fifth Mercury flyby, we, we make a, a break, we, we burn our engines, and or we use the engines to, to um, get into an orbit around Mercury. We have problems with communication because the spacecraft often is behind the sun. Mercury is always close to the sun, so it happens all the time that we are behind the sun. Um, we don't send any commands to a spacecraft when it's within five degrees of the sun because we are afraid we send a signal there and due to the solar plasma it's um, corrupted and it doesn't arrive properly at the spacecraft so within these five degrees we wait until it's back and then we continue. Um, we have an ion propulsion unit. Ion propulsion is a very nice technology. Um, it uses much less fuel than chemical propulsion but um, it's, it's, um, very, it's not as simple as a chemical, chemical engine, you, you fire it and it burns, but the iron propulsion, you have to keep the plasma and it's a um, challenging technology. We currently have some trouble with the solar arrays, the simulations tell us they get too hot, also we have heat leaks in there, so we are still struggling here and there to get the spacecraft to survive the solar um, heat. We are. Um, three to four times closer than the Earth, so it's 
uh, equivalent of 11 suns. We have a solar, a large solar simulator in, in Holland where we put this in there and there we discovered that it got too hot, uh, there are heat leaks. So we are still um, trying to fix these problems to make it ready for um, exploration of Mercury. So as I said, I have plenty of stories to tell about our project, but I think at this time I stop my presentation. Thank you. Um, <coughs> uh, independent um, checks and I mean nowadays with, with um, easy communication lines I mean there's always people who are critical who don't believe it um, you make independent research so I mean currently they, they have a monopoly the NASA is the only guys who can who have this huge <coughs> radar who can make this observation there's nobody else in the world who can cross check this but now we said baby Colombo there, so you have to make uh, more more measurements, taking different measurements, not relying on a single observation, and just always ask critical questions and not blindly believe what what you, you see in the papers. I mean, a lot of things are printed. Just question it and, and um, try to uh, reproduce it with different um, observations. So what are the instruments of baby Colombo? Um, I mean, we have uh, uh, cameras. Uh, we have um, two cameras: a high-resolution camera, optical. optical cameras. We have um, spectrometers for chemical composition. We have magnetometers to measure the magnetic field. Um, X-ray um, spectrometer. So the typical fleet of, of instruments you would have um, on a planetary obser uh, observer. I mean, it's the only shot to Mercury which um, ESA or Europe does for many years to come. So um, all the European scientific institutes were invited to provide instruments. And so we have um, a fleet of all um, instruments which you can bring there. Yeah, is there also a radar? Or there is a, a laser altimeter on board. Not, not a real ra radar, there's a laser altimeter on board. No radar. A laser altimeter. But not a, I mean, radar, you need real power. Our radar is we don't have. have like enough power from, uh, from the sun. Yeah, the funny thing is, we have to turn away our solar arrays because they get too hot. So we sometimes we have them 70 degrees away from the sun because um, if we expose them to the sun, they, they get too hot. That's what I mentioned here. The solar arrays, they get too hot. So we, in theory, we have a lot of power, but <laughs> the solar arrays, you have to turn them away. something about the uh, commission itself, like the um, laser action meter. Uh, is there something more? Because you told about the measurements from Earth, like the radio telescope and other measurements that are based on Earth. Could there be high precision um, accelerometer, accelerometer so anything else, like they're doing in Earth orbit against the or something? That you're measuring the uh, J2 and other uh, changing uh, onboard? Yeah, and we have an accelerometer on board exactly to do the, for the gravity field. Um, in order to observe the gravity field, you want to see only the effects of the gravity. And you want to um, um, eliminate all the external forces. So you measure all the acceleration from solar radiation pressure. And for this you need the accelerometer to, um, have, yeah, to cancel this out or to remove the, these forces. Also, um, all your um, reaction wheel control and your attitude control introduces perturbations, so you have to make sure that you only sample the signal from the gravity field. Mm -hmm. And for this, um, I forgot to mention the accelerometer on board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it would be a pity when you're going there, you have chosen the wrong numbers, like the one when you're crashing uh, after 300 days, and then at least you have some numbers to correct your first uh, estimation. Yeah, I mean, we still have a few years uh, before we are launching. And um, I mean, whether we go to 400 km or 500 km, we can even decide on the fly. We, we have six years travel time, so um, you could uh, adjust your altitude 
during the time when we are um, approaching. So, um, but at some point in time, we would love to have a real good um, understanding. Of the, I mean, currently our uncertainty is in the upper center is only 100, only it's 150 kilometers, so it's still quite big. And our thermal design, of course, you don't want to overdo it. That you put it too high, you want to go as low as possible. So the smaller this error is, the better you can design your spacecraft, the better orbit you can, you can find. The NASA satellites still uh, still still orbiting it. Not fresh. No, they they have yeah. I'm not sure they have orbit control, but they have an um, engine to, to raise the orbit. We, we will not be able to change our orbit. Once we are there, we rely on the natural forces and we are uh, pushed where, where the nature drives us to. So it's a great risk when you don't have the right coordinates. I mean, it's exploration. It's, it's, um, we want to explore Mercury. I mean, what, what, what I've shown earlier. I mean, these cases are now ruled out. We are basically somewhere in this, these two areas, so we we have a much better clue now. So we are not completely in the blind. And uh, what could happen that uh, maybe after two years something gets too hot and we lose instruments and it starts failing. But this is part of the exploration. I mean, we want to uh, explore Mercury, and um, of course, yeah, we have the lecture before. You have to communicate, you have to be ready if something fails, that um, you have to communicate, um, okay, there was a problem, but it's not a failure of the mission, it's uh, part of the exploration. Okay, I would, sort of fun. I would say um, we had two great discussions and talks, so thank you. If you have further questions, so take the opportunity outside asking everything you want. You will do now the uh, lunch break. There will be something on the table. Grab it until it's there. And check the session bit because it could be changed. The next one in this room, just come here perhaps 10 minutes earlier, give me a presentation and we will check the Vina stuff. So thank you. I think the presentation was really great, both of them. So, no, no.